I'll go to it. Our sermon title for today is simple. We're back in our simple series, uh, and it's Jacob Receives the Blessing. We're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 33. So if you want to go ahead and turn to Genesis 27, hold your place there, and then flip two chapters back to chapter 25. We're going to begin in there in a little bit. And, and um, it's really easy to find Genesis because you open your Bible and you go Genesis and you're there. So that's it. So as you're turning there, I want to give you a little bit of a breakdown of what's happening here. So um, God makes Abraham a promise, okay, to be the father of a nation. God appears to Abraham and says, hey, I have chosen you. You are going to be the father of a great nation, right? Abraham and his wife, what's her name? Sarah, or at the time, Sarai, they have a son. His name is Isaac, okay? Um, Isaac marries, you didn't know there was going to be trivia today, right? Isaac marries who? Rebecca, right? Okay, at 40 years old is when he gets married, all right? Um, they couldn't have children. They pray for children, and then God finally uh, grants their prayer, and uh, she becomes pregnant, and th- there's like more going on inside of her, and there's like more jostling, actually, as Scripture says, and you're like, oh, it, she's like, man, th- this baby inside of me is, is moving around a lot more than normal. Like, I've, I've been around a lot of pregnant women, and there's a lot more happening inside of me. God, what is going on? So she prays to God, and God says, well, actually, uh, there's a funny story here. So um, we pick up Genesis chapter 25 in verse 23. And it says, the Lord said to her, so Rebecca asked God, why is there so much movement inside of me? The Lord said to her, two, what's that word? Nations are in your womb, which is kind of a really weird way to say it. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, that's, that's especially back in that culture. The older son always had kind of the power. He was the patriarch of the family, and then the younger son was under him. That's just how it worked. And God is prophesying here and saying, hey, This is going to be reversed. The older son is going to serve the younger son. Now, keep that in mind, of course. It's really important here in a little bit. So we've got Rebecca and two, it says two nations. So two brothers are inside of her and they're 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 jostling, like I said, scripture says. They're they're like it's almost like they don't get along from the very get-go. And of course, they were woomates, right? Verse 24, we're just going to move on from there. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau, which means hairy. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Now, I don't want to say picture this because it's kind of weird to picture this, but like, like, She's giving birth, and Esau, the the older son, comes out, and it's almost like Jacob wants to come out first, and so he, he, from the womb, grabs the heel. I mean, we've read this a million times, but think about how crazy that is. I mean, it's, it's, again, from the very beginning, these two brothers are are battling. They're, They're struggling for power, and that continues all through their life. And it says, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Verse 27, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And here's really where the strife enters into the story, right? Right? Parents, just a freebie, don't do the favorites thing, okay? It doesn't work out, and we, we see it in this story over and over and over. In fact, a wise man once said, ain't no drama like family drama. 
Amen? It's true. And there was no shortage of drama in this family. Um, By the way, so Isaac the father, who was Isaac's brother? Anybody remember? Isaac had a brother. What was it? Ishmael. Okay. What is Ishmael known for? Or Ishmael is the father of the what race? The Arab race. So, I mean, it's almost like they're continuing in this pattern of strife between brothers. Do we see any strife between the Arabs and the Israelites now? Just a little bit, right? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, as we read this story, there's going to be one very apparent reality, and that is nobody in this family trusts each other. Each of them are kind of out for their own good. They try to circumvent what God is trying to do, and they don't trust each other, and we're going to see that over and over. So now, Genesis chapter 27, verse 1. Here's our passage. It says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son... Here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, We're four verses into this passage, and we already have two problems. You may not have spotted them because you kind of have to dig a little bit deep, but the first problem, and again, we don't see it just from this passage, but it seems that Isaac is overreacting about his age, okay? Now, granted, at this point, we believe he was about 137 years old. Okay, so, all right, I'll give it to you. That's pretty up there. Now, they lived a lot longer than, than we do now, okay? But 137 years old, he's pretty up there. So he's like, I'm, I must be getting close to the end of my life. But here's the thing. He ends up living for another 43 years after this. So maybe he was, maybe he was ill. Maybe he had something going on. Maybe he was a hypochondriac. I have another theory, though, and I I, I learned this as I was studying this week. Ishmael, his older brother, died at 137 years old, it's believed. So when Isaac hit 137, he may have thought, well, if my brother died at 137, my older brother, maybe I'm going now. So I don't know, but it seems like he's rushing things a little bit, which leads us to our our second problem that we have already. It's that it looks like Isaac is trying to circumvent what God has already told Rebekah and to push Esau to have the blessing. Remember back in in chapter 25 when God appeared to Rebekah and, and God said, the older will serve the younger. Basically, the younger one is going to get the blessing of the family to be the patriarch of the family. And Esau or Isaac would have known that. So it seems like what he is trying to do was go around what God had planned and put something in place. Think that's dangerous territory to do that? I would definitely say so. Now, why was this blessing thing such a big deal? Well, it, it, it wasn't just about an inheritance and stuff because there was also a birthright. That was a little different thing. Oddly enough, we're not going to talk about it today, but, but Jacob had already scammed Esau out of the birthright too, remember, with the bowl of red beans, like he sold his entire birthright for a bowl of red beans. But it's not just about inheritance, but it's the blessing was more of this prophetical proclamation that they would make over their sons or over a nation or over people. And, and the, the way that God had them do it back then, that it was actually like when the patriarch of the family 
called his oldest son in and pronounced this blessing. It was like God made it happen. And so this blessing was a humongous deal to have that proclaimed over you. And again, normally that would go to the older son. That would go to Esau. But God had already told them, no, 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 no. The older is going to serve the younger. Now, by the way, I want to just time out for a second, and I want to wreck your Sunday school thinking of this story. Because when we picture this story, we picture Isaac at this old man, and then we picture uh, Jacob and Esau as, as younger men, maybe, you know, in their teens or in their 20s, right? That's normally how you would picture this story. Anyone know how old we think they were when this happened? 77 years old. So, like, whoa, that just wrecks your Sunday school idea of how this story goes. But it's like they were, they were older, should have known a little bit better. Now, <clears throat> verse 5. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Now, if anyone is ever wondering where Jacob got his deceiving skills, look no further. He got them from his mother. That's what she's trying to do. She's trying to scheme and scam Esau out of his blessing. Verse 9, go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Now, again, here's here's a big problem, right? We have the correct end result. We know Jacob is supposed to get the blessing, but we have the incorrect method by which it's going to happen. Rebecca, and then consequently Jacob, knew what God had said, but didn't trust that God was going to make it happen. Didn't trust God enough to kind of be patient and let God do his work, however he was going to do it. I mean, it looked like the blessing was going to go to Esau. And Rebecca was, no, 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 I have to step in, and I have to help out God in this situation. You ever tried to help out God? It just doesn't work, does it? It's, it's, it's a major crash and burn. So I wrote this down. Knowing God's word and following God's will does not supersede doing things God's way. We, it, we, uh, yes, we need to know God's word. We have to be rooted and grounded in God's word, okay? This is, this is instruction for life. B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. I didn't make that up. But knowing God's word and following God's will... Knowing the plan that he has for us, the path that he has for us, following that doesn't supersede us doing things God's way. We need to be patient and let God do what God's going to do. The end does not justify the means is how we would say it. We see a lot of shortcuts in life, and we know how it's supposed to end up, but we take that shortcut in order to avoid some, you know, some little details along the way. And that's just not how God has us doing things. Verse 11, Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. Okay, Look at that verse. There's one word in there that bothers me more than anything else. Anybody, can you guess what word that is? It's in verse 12. What if my father touches me, I would, what? Appear 
to be tricking him. He wasn't worried about the fact that he would be tricking him, that this was wrong, that this was against God. He was worried that he would be found out. I would appear to be tricking him. Uh, Yeah, you are. Here's our first point. Simple followers of Jesus value righteous living over the fear of unrighteous consequences. Followers of Jesus, true, simple followers of Jesus, we, we have to value righteous living. Like, like living according to how God has called us to live, being salt and light in this world, living that way has to be more important than being worried about being caught. Like your motivation for not doing wrong shouldn't be because you think you might get caught. It should be because, hey, God wants me to live rightly. God has called me to righteous living. Am I going to mess up? Am I going to? Yes, absolutely. But we are striving to look more and more and more like Jesus. That's sanctification. And when we're worried more about the consequences, and that's our driving force of why we're not doing wrong and not living a God-honoring life, there's a big problem there. I wrote this down. If you're more concerned about the penalty of sin than the damage it does to our hearts and our relationship with God, something's very wrong. Simple followers of Jesus value righteous living over the fear of unrighteous consequences. Verse 13 His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Now, it's it's funny that she says that. It's like, okay, like, listen, if we get found out and there is a curse and it's heading your way, move out of the way and and I'll catch it, okay? It's like, it, it doesn't exactly work like that. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. Remember, Jacob's 77 years old, and his mommy is still telling him, do what I say. This family has some major problems, don't they? I'm glad all of our families are perfect. (laughs) Even though this is a very dysfunctional family, God is a very functional God who was able to complete his plan and purposes despite the dysfunction, sin, impatience, and selfishness of his chosen people. We are very, very dysfunctional, but thankfully God is very functional. God is able to use even our broken pieces and turn them into masterpieces. That's what God does for us. Sir Walter Scott says this, Oh, what a tangled web we weave, what? When first we practice to deceive. Ooh. C.S. Lewis says it like this. A little lie is like a little pregnancy. It doesn't take long before everyone knows. <clears throat> you know another thing about pregnancy? It doesn't take long until it's apparent. <clears throat> you want more? No, I don't have any more. <laughs> You don't want more, trust me. Here's our second point. I'll give you that. Simple followers of Jesus value God's timing over God's blessing. God's timing in our lives must be more important. Hey, the blessing, awesome. I'm all about God's blessings. Hear me. I'm all about receiving blessings from God. But if I have to go around God's timing, if I have to try to do things on my own, I'm missing the point. See, because in God's timing is when I learn. In God's timing is when I grow. In God's timing is when I figure out I don't have this all figured out. And God is trying to teach me something. And if God just gave us what we asked for all the time, just right away, we really wouldn't learn much, would we? So as God takes us through these storms and these trials and these challenges and that, there might be a blessing coming, but he is trying to teach us all along the way, and 
He's trying to grow our faith and grow our dependency on him. God's timing is perfect. The question is, will we be patient enough to wait for him? I love the passage in Psalm chapter 27, 13 and 14. It says, I remain confident of this. Now, now just read this as a declaration. Read this as, as the writer of the psalm just, just proclaiming this almost like he's not convinced of it, but that he is ingraining it in his mind. He says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, pause. I would imagine that he was maybe going through some stuff right now. I would imagine that things were not hunky-dory, that, that things were very challenging, and that maybe his faith was, was starting to waver, and that like he had to tell himself, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then there's verse 14. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and what? Wait for the Lord. I, I, I love that he says that. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. It, 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 he has to repeat it. He's like, nope, I'm going to wait for God. I'm, I'm going to be patient. I know his will and his way is way better than mine. And Rebecca knew that the blessing was going to go to Jacob, but was unwilling to wait for God's timing. Verse 14. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. I like that it keeps calling it tasty food. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands in the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. I wonder if the bread was tasty. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Now, hopefully you see it there. You realize that we just entered a whole different realm of deceit and lying and sin. You see it? You see what he did there? What do we call that? What, what did he do? That we, we have a phrase for it. What, what did he do? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the commandments. It's number three. What is it? Don't use the Lord's name in vain or don't misuse God's name. Now, he also lied too. That's another big one there. But the third commandment, you know, if you're, if you're NIV, it's, you know, don't misuse God's name. If you're, if you're, you know, old school King James, it's don't use the Lord's name in vain. Now, we, we often think of it that way in using it as an expression, using God's name as an expression or a, a curse word, right? And yes, that is the case, but that's not really what that commandment is saying. It, it, it really means more like don't Use his name in another way, or also don't leverage God's name for your own benefit. That's really what that commandment means. Now, now, of course, we use it in, in expressions. We use the OMG, all right? We even, and, and, and just admittedly, I'm a stickler on this, okay? It, we even often sometimes even, like, we say, dear Lord, like, Okay, that's not OMG, but still, are you really speaking to him in that point, or is it really you're just using it as an expression? And it's probably number two. Or, or this one, I swear to God, I wouldn't. Scripture actually talks about that. So that's the expression part. 
But the leverage part that it also means misusing God's name is, I've, I've heard this before, God told me to tell you. Really? Because God didn't tell me that, and in fact, God has kind of told me different things, so it, it kind of here's my response. Would you do me a favor? Would you go back to God and ask God to have him tell me that? Because he's telling me something different. Or it's like, God told me to do this. Maybe you've heard or said that one before. I, I know God, God told me to do this thing, and I've had people say that to me, and I'm like, well, that's against God's word. So I'm pretty sure God didn't tell you to do that or didn't tell you that's okay. And what we're often trying to do is trying to justify our wrong behavior, but if we slap God's name on there, it's almost like it becomes acceptable, right? Not really. Or how about this one? God just wants me to be happy. Uh, God wants you to be obedient, and obedience ends up in joy and, 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 and all of that. And does God want you to be happy? Sure, but not at the expense of what he has already called us to do in his word. So scripture is very, very clear about the strength and the power and the value of God's name. Be very, very careful not to use it except for only in its intended use. That's what the third commandment is. But that's what Jacob's doing. He's like, oh, the, the Lord your God gave me success. Ooh, that was not the right thing to say. Verse 21, then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. See, he was already having some doubts. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Actually, they're goat skins, but whatever, okay? He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked? I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought some wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Now, I'm assuming that's a good thing. What I really think that means is, uh, Esau had a very distinct B.O., like he had been hanging out in the field all day long, right? And hadn't washed his clothes in a while, and maybe Jacob smelled more like the shopping mall. And so he was like, I mean, it smells like you. I, I, I got it. Okay. Verse 28. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine, this is the blessing. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. This leads us to our third and our final point. Simple followers of Jesus value and treat the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not a political statement. I am not trying to be political in this moment. I didn't go digging for this. It just came across in this passage. This is a very timely theological and biblical statement that the nation of Israel is blessed by God, and those who bless the nation of Israel will be blessed. It's over and over and over in Scripture. So we've got to be very, very, very careful. In fact, here it is. God honors and blesses those who support the nation of Israel, 
And here it is, as well as those who support those who support Israel. Again, not trying to be political. I I usually do not do that from this pulpit. But I want to be very, very clear because it is my job to take things that are happening in this world right now, look at Scripture, and give you application on how to use that. You might say, hey, I support Israel, I stand with Israel, that's great, that's part of it, but when you support people who do not support Israel, you are not supporting Israel. I just want to put that out there, again, not trying to be political, but I make no apologies about that because it is clearly in God's word. These are God's chosen people. It doesn't mean that he loves them more than he loves us, but he chose them to rise up his son Jesus through those people. And we are standing here today because they had courage and they came out and spread the word. And that's why we are here worshiping an awesome, amazing Savior. Amen? Amen. Okay. Anybody unclear on that one? If you are unclear, take me out to lunch. I'll explain it further. (laughs) Verse 30. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn son Esau. He had to get that in there. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed he will be blessed. Something very interesting is going on here. Why did he say, and indeed I will be blessed, and why was he trembling? Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever read the story that we've seen a million times and thought about why was he trembling? Why did he say, indeed, he will be blessed? I think it's probably because Isaac was convicted, because Isaac knew Jacob was supposed to get the blessing. And Isaac knew in that moment that what he tried to do was go around what God was trying to do and give the blessing to his favorite. And I I think about this, and I want to push back on it and say, but it was the right of the older son. That's not how you set this up, God. God, I don't understand. Why would you do it like this? And there's times where you read through Scripture, and and, and this is a comfort to me, that, you know, you may not believe this, but I certainly don't have all the answers, okay? That was sarcasm. But I take great comfort in reading through Scripture and understanding that I don't have to understand everything. Now, I do my best to look into it and research it and look at other Scripture and look at commentary and all that. But at the end of the day, I'm probably not going to understand everything about God. I have come to that conclusion. And here is where I take comfort in that. And this is just an overarching principle. This plays out into a lot of different areas, and we're going to finish with this. God does what he wants, when he wants, however he wants, as long as it's within his nature. You may have a lot of questions for God about why he did things the way he did, and that's great. And if you still remember them when you get to heaven, you can ask him that. But I take great comfort in knowing that I don't have to understand God fully. I know that he loves me more than anything. I know that he loves me enough to send this most precious thing to him, his son Jesus, to die for me. And if it was only me on this earth, he still would have done that. And if it was only you on this earth, he still would have done that. I know those things. I know a few other things about the Bible, but there's a lot of things I don't understand. But I know God is sovereign. 
And I know God can choose to do things as long as it's within his nature that I don't have to understand how he works. But I think in this moment, Isaac knew he messed up. That's why he trembled. That's why he said, you know what? This was God's plan. I tried to go against it. But God's plan will prevail. So three simple truths from this passage. Number one, simple followers of Jesus value righteous living over the fear of unrighteous consequences. Number two, simple followers of Jesus value God's timing over God's blessing. And number three, simple followers of Jesus value and treat the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. Let's pray. God, thank you that you show us in your word that we don't have to understand everything to know that you are a good God. God, thank you that you chose very, very imperfect people, messed up, sinful, scheming, conniving people to do your will. And God, I could say the same thing for myself. I stand here today a broken sinner. But that you love me enough, God, and you love your people enough to use us in an awesome way to further your kingdom. Thank you, God, as as we said, God, you take the broken pieces of our lives, the, 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 the sin, the, the mess-ups, the, the, all of the junk, you take those broken pieces and you turn them into masterpieces. We thank you, God, that you are a perfect Savior, a perfect God loving an imperfect people. Thank you, God, for rising up this family to be a great nation, to be the leaders, to carry your Savior through. God, that that Savior would be offered to us a couple thousand years later. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that that you have made a way for us to spend eternity with you. God, I know here this morning that there are some people who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They have not made that declaration that, Jesus, you are my Savior. You are the master of my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you know that you need a Savior, that you this morning know that you want Jesus to be in your life, I want to make it really simple for you. Just say, God, I need you. God, I trust you. I I trust that Jesus died for me. And not just died, but rose again three days later. Proving victory over death and sin. Taking my sin. Taking my shame. Buried it on the cross. Setting me free. And making a way for me to spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I would love to celebrate with you. I'd love to pray over you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you come up front. Nothing like that. But I would love to know that today is the day that you decided to give your life to Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today I got it right. Today is the day I gave my life to Jesus. God, we thank you that you are such a good God. 
that you love us so much. Your word said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And God, that is what you did for us. You came to this earth as a baby, lived 33 years and died for us and rose again. Thank you for that perfect gift, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are such a generous God. God, help us to be generous back to you. God, help us to be generous back to a lost, broken, and dying world. And God, as we have this time of offering, may you be honored by it. That we are not giving out of our excess, but God, that we are sacrificially giving in a way that you can further your kingdom and you can do amazing things. Things that aren't just going to last for a handful of years, but things that are going to last for 10,000 years. Thank you, God, that you are good. We pray all of this in the most awesome name, the powerful, holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.